Have you ever, any of you ever gone through a season where you, you feel like, boy, I've run this far, and like right, right at the end, you're like, you hit the wall, or like, you end up just rolling through that finish line, you're like, all right, I guess you got me here, great. Um, I would just really resonate with those guys. So I um, want to share a couple, th- um, couple things on my heart this morning. For those of you that don't know, my name is Sean Connor Anderson. Um, I'm delighted, honored, privileged, um, and humbled to get to uh, minister in the Word this morning. Um, and uh, hopefully something there's, there's here for you to encourage you um, and uh, something for you to take into your Monday. A um, couple things real fast. Uh, Stephanie Legendall and I recently started a new online venue uh, for equipping the saints in this house called Teacher Talk. Um, and it's, uh, it's really, oh, hey, okay, a couple of you have seen that. Hey, okay, oh, got, you know, got some applause on that. Um, that's exciting. So uh, we, um, we really just kind of birthed it out of a heart to help equip and resource the saints in, in journey uh, in their journey through the Bible. And, um, and one, of our, one of our first objectives is to, uh, is to inspire you um, to, uh, to connect to the Word made flesh. Um, how many of you know that it's not, um, it's, uh, God is not looking for us to check a box every morning um, that I read a couple verses in the Bible, but He actually wants to use that as a place to encounter us. He's the Word made flesh. He's not just the Word in print. He's, he's the Word in actuality. Um, so, uh, so we've been, uh, we've been enjoying that. I think we have two sessions up so far, uh, on our Journey Church Facebook page, as well as our Journey Church YouTube. So feel free to check that out. Be encouraged. There's a number of things that we, we walk through in there. Um, the other thing is uh, an event I'm doing. Um, and actually, we're doing as a journey worship community this Wednesday at 6.30, just for one hour. Uh, I'm calling it Taste and See. If you've already visited the bathrooms, then you saw the flyer. Um, and uh, what it is, is anybody in our house that you call Journey Home, uh, that um, you happen to be a singer or an instrumentalist that's been hiding, uh, hide no more. We want to invite you out to a Taste and See event this coming Wednesday, 6.30 to 7.30, to hear about journey worship and just some of the ways that you can get plugged in if you know you're called to, um, to lift up a joyful noise to the Lord. Um, so, uh, so feel free to come out for that. My wife's also making s'more bars. My mom's making her famous award-winning cheesecake. So, and, and we'll have healthy goodies there as well, but I, I got to highlight those because they're awesome. So, um, all right, we're going to get into it. Somebody say, get into it. All right. One of my heroes, I was listening to, um, uh, to a podcast recently where one of my living heroes was talking about how prophets over the last 10 to 20 years have been declaring that God is going to bring a one billion soul harvest into the kingdom. One billion. It's a lot of zeros. And, um, and he was talking about it in the context of saying that it's, it's begun that the awakening that's actually happening in the countries in Europe right now is unprecedented, and no one saw it coming because everyone called Europe the dark continent. And so now you have revivalists who are popping up all over in countries across Europe, and literally they're seeing the manifest presence of God. I love this. Somebody's really getting excited. Seeing the manifest presence of God pulling people. It's the kindness of God that leads people to repentance, and it's happening in countries across Europe. And so he's declaring that the one billion soul harvest has begun, but I want to um, back up and I want to support some of what uh, Sylvia was sharing is that um, it's not enough that we, and I, it's applause worthy, but it's not enough that we applaud what God's doing. We actually have to connect to it. Because, because even, even if God in his sovereignty, even if God just, um, just delighted to meet every one billion people in their dreams overnight, which he could. He could. But even if he did, the next morning, they need a place of connection. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, actually Sherry was hitting this this morning in intercessory prayer. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, the next thing he said is he turned to the people and he said, unbind him and let him go. He actually gave them a responsibility in the midst of the miracle that just happened to actually continue the wholeness that he, that he inaugurated. So it, it, we come to understand then that you and I weren't actually just meant to sit in a pew. We were meant to fill one. I'll use different language. We weren't just meant to uh, sit in a row of chairs. We were meant to fill one. Because, because it's no longer, we've actually, we've shifted in the culture of church across this country, and, it, and it, it's begun and it's, and it's continuing, that no longer is it the role of the person behind this pulpit to get people saved. It's your role. It's your role. Someone say, I'm freed to free. 
Yeah, I'm free to free. All right, somebody came with their encouragement this morning. I appreciate it. I got like a spirit of Barnabas coming from this side, side of, the, um, of the house this morning. So in, in order to understand this, I'm, I'm going to hit some umbrella points, and then we're going to kind of dig down into some scriptures. So if you brought Bibles or Bible apps this morning, I'm going to be in Isaiah 61. Then I'm going to be in Hebrews 12, and I'm going to be in 2 Corinthians 5. But I'm going to bounce around to some other places too, so bear with me. Take notes, please, because the, these, are, these are some fairly hefty concepts to, to walk out. One of the things that we come to understand is that Jesus didn't come to just preach a gospel of salvation. That's important, and there's a good news that basically says this. Um, sorry, our old good news said something like this. The gospel of salvation is someday you go to heaven if you pray this prayer. That was the gospel of salvation. I'm really watering it down, so bear with me. But the gospel of salvation, if it's all about eternal life, if it's all about heaven someday, when Jesus said in John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that you would know him, the one true God, and his son whom he sent. That means that if I know Jesus now, I can experience eternal life now, which makes saying a prayer for someday obsolete. So the good news even of salvation is no longer someday. The good news of salvation is I can know God in the now. Boom. All right. But that isn't even what the core of what Jesus was preaching. Jesus picked up a baton pass from a guy named John the Baptist, who when John the Baptist came out, um, we'll, just, we'll, we'll just assume he looked something like Dave King. Okay, they're both prophetic voices. They're the voices of one crying in the wilderness. Okay, so, so uh, a John the Baptist comes out, and John the Baptist comes out to the Jordan because let's just be honest, there was no, there, there was no real hardcore faith happening in, um, in Jerusalem, so you gotta go, uh, okay. I'm going to bypass that. So he had to go to a place where he knew that through prayer and fasting and through discipleship and the ministry of baptism, he said, I've come baptizing to to illuminate, to reveal the one who's to come. He comes out and he begins preaching these words, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, now, we got to break this down, because you and I see the word repent on a, uh, on a billboard sign about 10 miles from here, and it says, repent, Jesus is coming soon. I wish they would actually change that to repent, Jesus already came, it's awesome. Because when Jesus came, he came, it says, um, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which mean, means God with us. That's not just a one-time event. That's not just Christmas. That's not just the Christmas story. He was inaugurating an entire age in humanity in which God would be with us and he'd never leave us. Now, he came for 33 years in the personage of Jesus, but then Jesus said, it's better that I go because I'm going to send you the comforter. I'm going to send you the parakletos. I'm going to send you Holy Spirit who will be with you. That's why he could honestly say, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. So when we're talking about the good news of the kingdom, we're talking about, here's John the Baptist. He starts releasing this message, repent, and it just means change your thinking. It doesn't mean, uh, I want to break this off. Repent doesn't mean feel guilty about your bad, the bad things you've done. It, it, does, it does not mean feel sorry for yourself. It doesn't mean continue to wallow in your shame. Repent means change your thinking. Why is he saying that? He's saying, repent. Both of them said this. John the Baptist said it, then he passed the baton to Jesus, and Jesus picks it up, and he starts running with this thing. Repent. Change your thinking. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. What's he saying? The entire divine government of heaven has actually drawn near. Like, imagine, like, if you can, like, let's stretch our imagination for a second. You and I live in America. I want you to imagine for a moment that Blasting through these walls came an entire country complete with its capital, castles, uh, um, heads of state, um, its own form of government, its own roadways, its own systems, its own laws, and it came busting through the church. That's essentially what Jesus and John the Baptist were saying. They're saying in the spirit that you can't see physically, he said the kingdom of heaven is drawing near. It's at hand. Now, it's incredible enough that they would say, we're going we're gonna to take the entire divine government of heaven and make it so near, it's as close as breath. It's as close as you saying, Jesus, come. It's as close as you saying, Holy Spirit, I need you. And it's, it's enough that he would take the divine government and actually bring it within reach, but it's more incredible that the entire divine government would exist in the person of God. And so when it says the kingdom of heaven has drawn near you, he's saying God has drawn near you and he's never going to be inaccessible again. Somebody needs to hear this morning. God 
The one who made it all, the one where it says he breathed stars into existence has drawn near you and he'll never be inaccessible to you again. Now that's good news. That's good news. It's not good news that like I say a prayer and I feel a little bit better, but tomorrow I'm really dealing with the same brokenness I came in with. No, no, no. What we're going to discover in just a second here is he came with good news that breaks bondages, that breaks chains, that breaks, that breaks everything you've ever experienced. It breaks trauma. It breaks tragedy. It breaks pain. It breaks every ounce of evil that has ever befallen your life, and it sweeps it away in one gesture. That's the gospel. That's the good news. It's drawn near. Someone say freedom. Now turn to your neighbor and say, get you some. Get you some. All right. There's another, there's another umbrella point I want to I hit just briefly. In Ephesians 2.8, I'm going to ride through this real fast and get, so we can get to Isaiah 61. In Ephesians 2.8, it essentially says this. You and I are saved. You and I are sozo. You and I are set free, delivered, healed, whole. We are saved by grace through faith. One of the things that I'm finding, and I'm not just saying journey, I'm saying spirit-led church-wide. A lot of people, a lot of, a lot of churches in our streams rest too heavily, and I'm not, I'm gonna, I don't even like those terms, but we, we bank on the grace of God so much, we take our responsibility completely out of the equation. Hebrews 6, 1 says it this way. It says, I want to move you on from the elementary principles of God. And the first one that he lists is he says, repentance from dead works and faith towards God. In one case, God brings the grace, which is the supernatural power for you to, for you to be able to affect change in your life. Grace isn't just unmerited, undeserved favor. That's, that's a doctrinal phrase that we threw, that we threw into the mix because it sounds really cool, but no one really understands it. So grace is the supernatural power to change what I couldn't change yesterday. So grace comes into my life, and the loving kindness, see, when grace comes, loving kindness always comes. See, because when his word comes to us, it's the thing that comes with grace. It comes with holiness. It comes with the very thing it's packed to accomplish. Hallelujah. So when grace comes into my life, it, when the, it, says in, uh, it says in, I believe in Romans, that the loving kindness of God leads me to repentance. And that repentance is both a mind change and it's a 180. It shifts me to move in another direction. And now I'm executing faith towards God. Someone say, I got to move. Because your movement is required to complete the transaction. So we come to find that when we're saved, we're saved by grace through faith. If I don't actually begin moving in faith, I don't actually begin to walk in the fullness of this grace that he's given me. All right, that's Ephesians 2.8. One of the things that Scott has, has really been just moving in his spirit on in this season is this idea of a heaven and earth collision. That's just another way to say it. His grace collides with my earth to move, to move in faith. All right, Isaiah 61. When you're there, say I'm there. That's a, that's a good, good thing. All right. Okay, Sean. Let's hit four verses. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. Then they will be rebuild the ancient ruins. They will raise up the former devastations, and they will repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. I'm sorry. I like, I'm just getting wrecked here. First, there's something I didn't hit in the first service, and I want to get into the atmosphere. It says in verse 2, the day of vengeance of our God. When, when, the, when Jesus got up on a Sabbath, he had walked into, he had walked into a synagogue on a Sabbath day, it says, as was his custom, he, he opened the book of Isaiah, flipped to this page, and he began reading these verses. Incidentally, he also um, included, he, he shot in there uh, a verse that's not in this one. He says, to, um, 
to open the eyes of the blind. It's actually not in Isaiah 61, but he, th- he included it. But he closed the book right after to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he never says the day of vengeance of our God. And I want to propose to you that the day of vengeance of our God was the cross. It was one day of vengeance where God, God, in, his, God in, his, in his maneuvering, wanting, like God was constantly, from, from after the fall of Adam, God did everything that he could all throughout the Old Testament to maneuver around this thing of sin to get his love to the people that he, he wanted to so badly. So, so he's, he's, he's in his last maneuver, and, and it says the day of vengeance of our God, and that's the day of the cross, pouring out the wrath of God, stored up for all sin, past, present, and future from that moment. Someone needs to hear this morning, God's not angry with you. Some of you grew up with, with, a, with, an understand, with a really false understanding of who God is. God's not angry with you. And he's not distant from you. He's not aloof from you. He's not disinterested in you. He has his eyes squarely focused on you. One day of vengeance, it's done. See, he didn't proclaim it because it hadn't happened yet. Back up to verse 1. Spirit of the Lord, God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news. Someone say good news. Now that word bring good news, I want to actually jump on that real fast here. Oh, so many notes, so many notes. Bring good news means to bear news, bear tidings, publish, preach, show forth, to be fresh. That is full, rosy, for, uh, figuratively cheerful. Do I seem figuratively cheerful this morning? I hope so. To announce glad news. Now, interestingly, if you study that, if you study that word out, you'll actually find that there's, there's not much of a distinction between the, the person who brings the good news and the good news itself. That the, that the gospel itself actually became so synonymous with the person um, that, w- that they were one and the same. I'm going to come back to that when we hit Hebrews here in a second. Um, but let's back up. I want to hit a couple of these things. The Spirit of the Lord. Someone say the Spirit. When, it, um, when Jesus spoke those words, he used the word pneuma, which is the same word um, as ruach in the Old Testament. And it means this. It means wind, breath, or spirit. It also means the mind. The mind of God, the Spirit of the Lord, the breath of God, the wind of the Spirit is upon me because the Lord has anointed. That word anointed means to rub with oil. There's another, there's another definition of that word if you, if you dig down. It means to paint, to smear or to paint. So the wind of God comes upon a believer. The wind of God comes upon someone who has invited Holy Spirit to be the, the, um, the navigator of their life. Um, James, uh, James uh, 3 refers to it as the, uh, the pilot of the ship. And so we invite him to come out, and when the Spirit of the Lord comes on us, he comes as a wind, and in that, in the movement of that wind, interestingly, he paints us with his presence. He smears us with his presence. Now, it's interesting that he doesn't just smear us to say, I'm smeared. He doesn't just anoint us to say, oh, I'm anointed. That's fun. Thank you, God. Because there's more. Someone say there's more. It says, he's anointed me to bring good news. Someone say, I've got to open my mouth. Because at some point, if in the most likely scenario of one billion souls coming into the kingdom, someone's going to have to talk. Someone's going to have to talk. Someone's going to have to release the good news. Someone's actually going to have to declare what God has already done in the earth. Let's, do, let's get some text of life on this. How many of you are familiar with the Emancipation Proclamation? Okay, so um, when Abraham Lincoln signed that into law, it was somewhere around January 1st, 1863. It was two and a half years before that message, it's what we call Juneteenth, actually got to the last slave, um, slavery um, uh, contingents in Texas. They call that Juneteenth because that's the day that they actually heard the Emancipation Proclamation that initially set them free. How many of you know they were free two and a half years prior? But it took someone going. It actually took someone who understood, whoa, whoa, there's good news. There's good news. There's good news for an entire population and demographic of people in this entire country that says there's a freedom that they didn't know they had. Someone's got to go. Someone say, that might be me. Someone's going to have to go. Someone's going to have to make a sound because it says, he's anointed me to bring good news. What is it? He's anointed me to bring the sound of freedom. 
He's anointed me to bring a sound of liberty that says, hey, slave, you ain't no slave anymore. Not a slave anymore. There's an entire people group in this country who have still been under the mental anguish of something they were freed from 100 plus years ago. And it's time for freedom to ring, not just for a people group, but for everyone. Oh, come on. Don't make me get hashtag political. I will if I have to. But at some point, somebody's going to have to say something. He's anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted, to the poor. He has sent me. See, this is where, this is where, this is where you got to ask the question, well, how do we know that wasn't just Jesus? How do we know it's me? Because he said this to his apostles after he came back. He said, as the Father sent me, I send you. Not a single saint in the kingdom that is impervious to this assignment. He's anointed me sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. That word brokenhearted right there, um, it's two words. The first word, um, the first word is, uh, is shabar. The second word is lab, which means the lab, the second one is like inner mind, heart, soul of a person. But the first word shabar actually means shattered. Another way that you could render this passage is that he's come to bind up the shattered mind. Some people in this room have been dealing their whole lives with a shattered mind with a broken mind. And, and, and the, I, I want to break, I actually had this in my notes, but I want to break off this morning a spirit of futility that says this is always the way it's going to be. If, the, if it's always the way it's going to be, then Jesus' sacrifice was not enough. And I know that Jesus' sacrifice was enough because it's enough. Because it's enough. And so what we do is we apply by faith. What did I say before? His grace comes to me that says, his word comes to me that says, oh, he, he was sent to bind up my shattered mind. So by faith, I grab that and I start moving. I'm no longer broken. I'm no longer shattered. I'm not talking about the power of positive thinking. I'm talking about applying the supernatural grace of heaven. Did I, did I mention that the gospel of the kingdom is that the divine government of heaven has come near? And if the divine government of heaven has come near, then I have reason to rejoice. I have reason to believe that Monday is going to be better than last Monday. I have reason to believe that though I might walk it out, and like Sylvia was saying, it might be a process, but I'm going to start walking this out. Because if he said back here that he binds up the brokenhearted, if he said back here that he binds up the shattered mind, then, then tomorrow and tomorrow's tomorrow and tomorrow's tomorrow, I can actually begin to believe that he's going to do that work in my mind. He's going to do that work in my heart. Somebody say he's going to do it. Turn to your neighbor say that he's going to do it. Get you some. All right. <sighs> okay, so I'm going to fast forward out of some things because there's, a, there's, a, there's an element of this that I really want to share. I didn't get a chance to share in the 9 o'clock. Really feel, feel like it's important to share. So if there's more of this that, that you want that I'm not getting to today, um, just sh uh, get the, get the um, video of this online and, and you, can hear, you can hear some more of that. So Rick, we'll just make sure we get them both up. Not just one. All right. 61, Isaiah 61, 4 says this, Then they will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will raise up the former devastations. They will repair the ruined cities and desolations of many generations. Guys, they're talking about you once you've become whole. They're talking about you. If you actually trek this through, guys, there's so much. Part of what I was getting wrecked on is there's so much, uh, and we won't have time to get to it all today. But the, um, but the, the Isaiah 61.4 is talking about those who have been transformed, those, those uh, captives and prisoners who have now been set free to run and to be, they are the ones who actually become the change agents. They're, we're not just set free for our own freedom. It's beautiful. It, and it even says in, I think, Galatians 5.1 that um, it was for freedom that he set us free. But he, he backs that up and he, sa he then says, but now don't be subject again to a yoke of slavery. What's he saying? Like a dog that returns to its vomit, don't go back. So what we've got is 
we're set free for the purpose. Once we're free, we're actually activated. We're actually, we're actually in, in, endued with the power of God. Uh, Sylvia talked about the dunamis, the, the actual supernatural. It's where we get the word dynamite, the supernatural power of God to affect change in the earth. Jesus said in 1 John, I'm sorry, John said about Jesus in 1 John that he, um, that he was manifest to destroy the works of the enemy. It also says, as he is, so are you and I in the world. You were born to destroy the works of the enemy. So what you do is you don't take your freedom and be like, oh, cool, so now I can go to church every week and not feel bad. No! Now you can go out into the community and release the kingdom of heaven on earth everywhere that you go. That's easier said than done. Grace, faith. You start moving. You start moving. You start moving and you make some mistakes. You start moving and you get some wins and then you make more mistakes. And then you start to figure out, like, oh, okay, I shouldn't actually tell people that they're going to hell. How about, how about instead that heaven is available? Maybe that's a better way to go about this. So you try that, and it's, oh, wow, more people are coming into the kingdom. Hallelujah. And so you begin to move. Someone say, I got to move. All right, here's the last thing I want to do. Someone say, I'm free to free. Gotta find it, gotta find it. Yeah. So, one of, those, one of the parts of that verse says, the desolations of many generations. I learned how to ride a bike yesterday. 39 years old, I learned how to ride a bike yesterday. Thank you. I know, I think, I think that was pretty huge. Um... I have this faint memory of beginning to learn to ride a bike as a kid. And th there's one moment, I remember the color of the bike, I remember kind of like what felt to me really, going really fast. Um, for about 10 feet, you know, free of, you know, you, you get the parent's hand is like kind of holding on to you and then they let go and you don't know that they let go and you're doing it and they, you don't know that you're doing it and you look back and you're doing it and now you're scared to death. I stopped there. I stopped after that. I got breakthrough and then I stopped. And interestingly, ever since yesterday when I actually kind of came through the whole experience and legitimately could ride a bike. Thank you, Jesus, for Colleen Hart. She's a great little teacher. I realized that that experience marked me for so many different things across my life that I started and didn't finish. I, I mean, I have a clear picture of that memory. And... And I thought, wow, what would I have finished that I didn't finish that if, if, if I had just kept going, if I hadn't given up that day? And Colleen asked me yesterday, she said, she said so why, you know, why are you learning to do this? Why, why are you doing this now? I said, there's a, lot, there's a lot of reasons you could go through the benefits to your physical health. You, you know, I, it was one of, the, one of the 10 goals that I had for 2019 is I wanted to learn how to ride a bike. Um, but I said, I said, the real reason, because um, our kids were this, I real reason is right over there. I said, I don't want her to grow up with my fear as her ceiling. So when we talk about the desolations of many generations, can I ask us this morning, wherever you are, whatever darkness you're facing, whatever hurt that you're going through, whatever, whatever thing needs to be made whole instead of coddling that thing and instead of, instead of just making it through another day, can you actually like reach out in faith that like his grace is gonna collide with, with your earth? Because there's a generation, there's a generation that needs to have our fear not be their ceiling. There's a generation that, like, I'm, I, 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 the, the biggest source of wisdom that we could ever begin to operate in is to live for a generation we're never going to see. What if we were making decisions now for, for a generation that's 100 years down the road? Thank you. Someone say, I'm freed to free. And listen, it's not a small thing if the sum total of your freedom is to make sure that your kids or the, or the lives that you're pouring into that are younger than you get free, if all that you ever do was set free two people because your life was an example of the freedom that they needed, 
In heaven, that's immeasurable. In earth, that's small. In heaven, it's immeasurable. Okay, stand up, if you would, please. Prayer team, you can come right on down. So, guys, I'm not just closing out a message. I'm closing out a series here. So I want to I wanna give us an opportunity this morning, thinking all the way back to week one. Scott did an exceptional job laying out a strategy. It was a six-part framework beginning with the word, um, I think it was beginning with the word stop. Um, it was called stop, look, and listen. But the idea of, hey, I'm going to shut down, I'm going to rest, uh, so that I can actually breathe long enough to figure out where am I bleeding, where am I hurting, where am I in pain. Um, Lisa comes in week two and, 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 and brilliantly takes us into a new spot. And one of the things that I love that she said is that oftentimes our maturity ends at the place where we won't process our mourning. Where we, where we refuse to process our pain and, and our mourning and our grieving is usually this place where we stop maturing. And so I want to invite us this morning, um, answer this question just to yourself, and, and I want to give you, give you an opportunity to connect in prayer, like let your fa- first faith movement in this season be connecting with prayer with one of our saints. And, and I, I want to remind you, um, these are not perfect people who grew up perfect people. They're freed to free. Anyone who's ever standing here, anyone who's ever standing here, anyone who's ever standing here, they're not perfect. They're freed to free. All right. Ask this morning, am I free or am I in bondage? If I'm free, I need to free someone else. If I'm in bondage, I need to acknowledge my ownership of this place right now and take appropriate action. And that might be laying aside that encumbrance, laying aside that weight and that burden in prayer at the altar here with, with one, of our, one of our friends. Second question, am I bleeding? Am I broken? Or am I whole and I'm experiencing his grace? If I'm bleeding and broken, I've got to, ask, I've got to slow down and ask, what's the source? What's the lie? What's the trauma? Do I need to mourn? Do I need to process this with someone? If I'm whole, I need to get moving. Someone say get moving. Um, I need to adopt a, a 1 John 3 8 lifestyle of destroying. That actual word was loosing and releasing the works of the enemy is what that word actually means off of people's lives. I also want to encourage you, we have a lot of resources in this house, not just Oasis, but we've got, in our prayer team, we've got a Sozo um, ministry, we've got prophetic deliverance, we've got counseling ministries that if... If you get a touch from God today and it's like a Todd White experience, hallelujah. But if that's not your experience today, we have places, we have structures in place that can help you move towards wholeness. Someone say, that's good. All right. Lastly, I'm just going to get vulnerable here as we're closing this out and then Tony's going to come rescue me. Um, I'm in a season where for uh, months um, I've been seeing the numbers 1037, which to me means John 1037. And it was Jesus in the middle of one, of one of his sermons, and he says this. He said, if I don't do the works of my Father, the Amplified says, if I don't do the works that only God could do, then don't believe me. You don't have to believe this morning a word that I've said. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm looking in my life in this season to take on the same mandate that Jesus had in his own life, that if I don't actually work the miracles of God, then I give you permission to disqualify everything you just heard me say. It's his model. That's his model. And if, if Jesus put that qualification on his ministry, it's certainly on mine. So I'm, I'm being vulnerable because I'm, I'm asking the Lord for breakthrough. If you need a miracle this morning, I'm going to be standing right here, right alongside our other freed to free saints. Um, and if you need a miracle, you need a breakthrough this morning, and that can be in your physical body, that can be in your emotional life, that can be in uh, any aspect of the health in your lives. This is a whole person journey center. Um, I want to encourage you, get to one of us. We, we, want, we want the privilege of praying with you this morning. You guys good? Someone say it's good news. It's good news. And, it's, and, and one of the things you'll find out, read Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. It's worth dying for. And it's worth living for.